Hi everyone, welcome back to ASFC Physics. What we're going to be looking at today are the multiple choice questions from OCR's modeling physics paper from June 2017. Okay, so let's get started. Question number one, which of the following units is the correct unit for gravitational field strength? Okay, well, we know that the unit for, or the formula, excuse me, for gravitational field strength is, we can, let's just use the weight formula. So weight is equal to mg, just simply rearranging for g, we know that g is equal to the weight divided by the mass. The weight is just the force, which is measured in Newton, and the mass is just measured in kilograms. So uh, Newtons divided by kilograms, which leads us to the correct answer being B. Okay, question number two. We have four materials, A, B, and C, and A, B, C, and D, and they have the same length and cross-sectional area, and we have a graph of the force against extension. Which material is brittle and has the greatest ultimate tensile strength? Okay, well, you know that a brittle material is going to have a line of um, a straight line is going to look like a straight line when graphed under a force extension graph. So only A and B fit that criteria. Out of those two, B will break under a higher force. So uh, B is both Britain, brittle and has the greatest ultimate tensile strength. Okay, moving on to question number three. The braking distance of a car is directly proportional to its kinetic energy. So uh, if we call the braking distance D, we know that this will be proportional to the kinetic energy, which is a half mv squared. We don't really know the mass of the car, so I'm just going to simplify this and just say that the distance is proportional to v squared. Okay, well, we know that the braking distance of a car is 18 meters when its initial speed is 10 meters per second. What is the braking distance of the car in the same conditions when its initial speed is 25 meters per second? Okay, well, this question will be all about finding that constant of proportionality. So let's do this. Because d is proportional to v squared, there will exist a constant such that the following is true. d is equal to k multiplied by v squared, where k is just a constant. This is what we're going to try and find out. We know that k will be d over v squared. Now initially, when the uh, distance is 18 meters, when its initial speed is 10, divided by 10 squared, which is equal to 100. So we have found our constant to be 0.18. We know that uh, for our next case, when we increase the speed to 25 meters per second, everything is under the same conditions. Now, in other words, this means that this constant k is not changing. So let's apply our formula again. We know that, should we just say that the second braking distance is equal to the constant k multiplied by the second speed, so d, uh, so v, d2 and v2 squared. Okay, well, um, in this case, we're looking for the braking distance, which is d2, which is going to be 0 0.18 multiply by v2 squared, which is 25 squared. And if we multiply those two numbers, we're going to get approximately 113 meters, which leads us to the correct answer being C. Okay, question four. Ball is dropped from rest from above the ground and air resistance has a negligible effect on the motion of the ball. The speed of the ball is v after it has fallen distance h from its point of release. Which graph is correct for the falling ball? Okay, well, um, in this case, we, we have h against v squared. Now, how is v squared related to the traveled distance? Uh, we immediately know that the equation for that relates v squared and distance traveled is just the Suvat equation v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. Now because um, we're given h on the graph as the distance traveled rather than s, I'm just going to write h 
over here. Additionally, we know that the ball is dropped from rest, which means that the initial velocity is zero. So uh, this factor here of u squared will actually be equal to zero. So the formula that we're dealing with is that v squared is equal to 2a multiplied by h. Okay, well, in this case, all we need to do is just perform y equals mx plus c analysis. So our first step would just be to rearrange for whatever is on the y-axis. And we can see that h is on the y-axis, so I'm just going to rearrange for that. I'm going to get that h is equal to v squared divided by 2a, which I'm just going to write as 1 over 2a times v squared. You can always add a plus 0. Now you can see that uh, if you were to uh, use y equals mx plus c analysis, y equals mx plus c, we should actually be expecting a straight line because h is on the y-axis, v squared is on the x-axis. In this case, the gradient will actually be 1 over 2a, and the graph should be centered around the, um, around the uh, origin. So we can see that there are two graphs that fit uh, that, that criteria, A and D. However, because it says that uh, H is the distance from the point of release, that means that H will be increasing as time goes on, as the ball is falling. So therefore, the correct answer will be A. Okay, so question five, which is the best estimate of this area of a rectangular field of length 98 plus or minus 3 meters and width 47 plus or minus 2 meters? Okay, so one thing to notice beforehand is that our absolute uncertainties are given to one significant figure only. It's not 3.0 or 3.1 or 3.2. We only have one significant figure. So that means that our final answer will also be given up to one significant figure. So we know that it's not going to be D already because that's already given to uh, three significant figures. Okay, so let's find out which answer it is. Now, in order to find the uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty in the area, we need to find the area first of all, and we find the area by multiplying the length and the width. So it's going to be 98 uh, times 47. Now, if you put that into a scientific calculator, you're going to get 4606. Uh, square meters. However, notice that your input values of the length and the width, those are actually given to two significant figures, so we cannot really give our answer to four significant figures. We're not actually sure of that last digit. So up to two significant figures, the above is 4,600 square meters, and that's up to two sig figs. Okay, let's find our answer for the uh, absolute uncertainty. And in order to do so, um, what we need to do is find the percentage uncertainty in the length and find the percentage uncertainty in the width. We are going to be multiplying those, um, those um, because we're multiplying those quantities, what we need to do is need to add the percentage uncertainties. If you're not quite so sure why that is the case, please have a look at my um, combining uncertainties video, which you're going to find under the uh, module 2 playlist. Okay, so um, let's do that. Let's find the percentage uncertainty in the length. So as always, percentage uncertainty is plus or minus your absolute uncertainty, which is 3 divided by your value, which is 98 times 100 plus my absolute uncertainty is 2. My value is 47. I'm going to times that by 100. And what we're going to get if we input those values into a calculator is 7.3%. Okay, now let's find 7.3% out of um, our area. So um, what we can do is do 7.3% or 7.3 over 100 times uh, 4606, which if we input once again into a calculator is going to equal 337. However, our uncertainty needs to be given to one significant figure as we discussed earlier, which is actually equal to 300 up to one significant figure. Therefore, the correct answer is C. 
So this question was all about uncertainties and significant figures. Okay, question six. The flat end of a uniform uh, steel cylinder weighs 7.8 newtons and is glued to a horizontal ceiling, and that hangs vertically. The breaking stress for the glue is 130 kilopascals. The glue only holds the cylinder to the ceiling, so we're very, very close to that. We're essentially at that breaking stress. If we go above it, the cylinder will fall. What is the cross-sectional area of the cylinder? Okay, well, for this one, we need to remember our formula for stress, or we need to really just look it up in our formula sheet. So, we know that stress is equal to the force which is applied divided by the cross-sectional area. So, what I'm going to do is just rearrange for the area, which is going to be equal to the force divided by the uh, stress. Now, our force in this case really is the force due to, to the, due to the weight, which is 7.8 newtons. So, I'm going to divide that by 130 kilopascals. So, I'm going to be quite careful to include the kilos. Uh, that's 10 to the 3. So, it's going to be divided by, the, by 130 multiplied by 10 to the power of 3. And if we input that into a scientific calculator, we're going to get approximately 6.0 times uh, 10 to the power of minus 5 square meters for the area, which leads us to B for the correct answer. The intensity against wavelength graph of an object at 750 degrees Celsius peaks at a wavelength uh, lambda. Then we raise the temperature to 960 degrees. What is the wavelength now and the new uh, at the new peak intensity in terms of lambda? Okay, so this question is all about how wavelength and temperature are actually related. We know and we can see that in your um, in your formula sheet that the maximum wavelength lambda max is actually proportional to 1 over the temperature. Now remember that the temperature in this case is given with a capital T which signifies that this is actually given in Kelvin. So this question, this was quite a common, uh, the quite common exam uh, error if you read through the examiner report that not a lot of candidates actually converted those values to Kelvin. So we're going to need to be quite careful. We're going to need to add uh, 273 to our answers. Okay, let's uh, let's go through it. Now, the first thing to notice is because lambda max is proportional to 1 over t, we know that there's going to be a constant such that lambda max is going to equal k over uh, the temperature for some constant k. Let's find, our, let's find our constant. So k will be equal to lambda max multiplied by the temperature. Now, we know that when the temperature is 750, so when this temperature is 750, we have a wavelength of lambda. So what we can do is write lambda multiply by 750 plus 270, um, 273. Um, so um, this is going to equal to 1023 multiplied by lambda. This is actually a value for the constant k. Okay, well, we raise the temperature to 960 degrees. We have our value of the constant. Let's, um, let's find our lambda max. We know that in our second case, lambda max is going to equal the same constant k divided by a new temperature. Let's call it T2, so lambda max will be equal to, now rather than the constant k, what I'm going to do is just put that expression into there and get 1023 lambda divided by our second temperature, which is 960 degrees, so 960 plus 273 of course so that's not to be forgotten and um, if we plug that into a calculator and just divide 1023 divided by 960 plus 273 
Um, what we're going to get is the correct answer will be B, which is approximately 0.83 multiplied by lambda. So the correct answer is B. But uh, yeah, one of the main points of this question is that whenever we're using the lambda max is equal to 1 over t equation, we need to make sure that we have converted to Kelvin. Okay, question eight. The diagram shows two opposite vertical forces of magnitude 1.2 newtons and 2.1 newtons acting on an object. Which of the following statements could be correct? Number one, the object is accelerating and moving upwards. Yeah, well, this uh, certainly could be true because we know that uh, there's going to be a resultant force. Um, acting of about 0.9 newtons acting upwards. So the first one could well be true. Uh, second one, the object is decelerating and uh, moving down. Yes, this could also be true because if the object was, let's say, was uh, thrown uh, underwater, this 0.9 newtons here, this could be the amount of upthrust that is slowing the object down. So it all depends on the initial velocity. If the object was moving downwards, it could easily have a force going in the, up the opposite direction. So this could be true as well. And number three, the magnitude of the resultant force is 0.9 newtons. Well, yeah, we know that this is correct because the resultant force will just be 2.1 minus 1.2. So all three in this case are correct. The correct answer is D. Okay, question nine. This is quite an interesting one. A graph of some quantity y against distance r from the center of a planet is shown below. Uh, the graph shows that y is inversely proportional to r squared. Which quantity is best represented on the axis of this graph? Uh, so the graph tells us that y is uh, inversely proportional, so is inversely proportional to 1 over r squared. Uh, a, the period of a satellite orbiting the planet. Well, that is, I'm afraid, not correct. The reason for that is because Kepler's law tells us that the square of the orbital time period is proportional to r cubed, which means that t will be proportional to r raised to the power of 3 over 2. So that's not correct. Um, so that's for A, which shows us why it's not correct. For B, the gravitational potential. Well, the gravitational formula for the gravitational potential is that minus is, is gravitational potential is minus gm over r, not over r squared. So that's also not the case. Uh, C, the gravitational field strength of the planet, that's got to be a winner because we know that the formula for gravitational field strength is minus gm over r squared. So that absolutely fits this criteria. In fact, we know our constant proportionality if we wanted to calculate that because this is equal to minus g over m times 1 over r squared. So the gravitational field strength g is proportional to 1 over r squared, it's decreasing with the square of the distance. So the correct answer is C. Okay, question 10. Part of the line spectrum for, the, for light from the sun is shown below. Which spectrum best shows light from a similar star uh, to the sun? Okay, well, this question is all about red shift. So stars, distant stars, tend to exhibit um, red shift because the universe is expanding. And um, the Doppler effect equation, which sort of really controls this or describes this, is that your fractional change in wavelength, delta lambda over lambda, is equal to V over C. It's approximately equal to V over C. Now, um, something which many, many people got wrong on that year of the exam was um, a lot of people presume that every single wavelength gets shifted by exactly the same amount. And a lot of people opted for A being the correct answer because um, in uh, the A answer, all of 
the um, all of the wavelengths had shifted by exactly the same amount so let's take this one here so this one had shifted by this much and this one here had shifted by this much which is the same distance now this is actually not correct the reason for that is because well if we look at the doppler shift equation delta lambda over lambda is equal to v over c our change in wavelength delta lambda is actually equal to v over c multiplied by the original wavelength so larger wavelengths the larger your wavelength is, well, the larger your shift it will be because uh, they are directly proportional. So if this guy rises, delta lambda will also rise. So because the wavelength is increasing this way, that means that this wavelength is going to shift by a higher amount compared to some of those wavelengths over here. Now, uh, the only answer which exhibits this, this behavior is B. So we can see that um, this, this wavelength, let's, let's use a highlighter, that uh, these wavelengths here, they have shifted by some amount, but the ones to the right, which are higher wavelengths, have shifted by a lot more. This is why the correct answer is B. In A, they've shifted by exactly the same amount, which is not true. For um, C, um, well, one is sort of decreased, the other one has increased, uh, which is which is not true. And uh, D as well has this sort of strange pattern of behavior in which the lower wavelength has increased dramatically and the um, higher wavelength has hardly increased at all. So the only answer which matches our formula is B. Okay, folks, question 11, we're getting there. Tensile force of 4.5 newtons is applied to a spring. The spring extends elastically by 3.2 centimeters. What is the elastic potential energy of the spring? Okay, well, we know that the formula for um, elastic potential energy, which is also, of course, given in your formula booklet, is equal to a half uh, multiplied by the force multiplied by the extension. So this is going to equal to a half multiplied by four and a half newtons multiplied by our extension which is 3.2 centimeters let's not forget the centi which is 10 to the power of minus two if we put that into a scientific calculator we're going to get approximately 0.072 joules which leads us to the correct answer which is a Question 12. An object above the ground is released from rest at a time t is equal to zero. No air resistance to worry about. What is the distance traveled by the object between t is equal to 0.2 seconds and t is equal to 0.3 seconds? Okay, well, in general, the formula for distance traveled in terms of time is equal to ut plus a half a t squared, which is, of course, given in your formula sheet. Now, because this uh, object is released from rest, uh, we don't need to worry about the initial velocity u. Okay, well, um, all we need to do is find s at t is equal to 30, or 0 0.3 seconds, and then just take away s, the distance traveled, at 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, so let's do that. So uh, let's call that delta s, really. Uh, so that's going to equal half. Uh, times the acceleration of this object, which is uh, just um, just the acceleration due to gravity, which is not 9.81. So let's try and write that again. Multiply by 9.81, multiplied by 0.3 squared. And from that, we're just going to take away a half times 9.81 times 0.2 squared. And we need to carefully input those values into the scientific calculator. Uh, please don't forget to uh, square. That's actually one of the most common exam errors. Just, just forget to input a square either in writing or in your calculator. But if we input that correctly, we're going to get about 0.425. And because we're working in two significant figures in this question, we're going to round that up to 0.25, which is the correct answer being B.
So question 13, we're almost there guys. So a puck of mass 0.16 kg sliding on ice with a constant velocity of 11 meters per second. So let's just uh, quickly do a sketch. So we have our object. Let's say that it's sliding on ice. Look at that, perfect drawing. Okay, now it says that it's traveling with a constant velocity of 11 meters per second. So let's say that it's going this way over here at 11 meters per second a hockey stick exerts a force for a short period of time in the opposite and opposite notice that uh, it's written in bold which means that it's going to be quite important for our calculation um, so let's just visualize the force there's going to be some sort of a force f which is going to be just acting along the other way so a force there the momentum changes by two kilogram meters per second okay so this is really important so what actually happens is if we apply this sudden force and if we essentially hit the um, if we hit the, the puck then um, the momentum will change by two however it will be in the opposite direction so uh, what we can say is that the our change in mental delta p is going to be minus 2.0 kg ms to a power of minus one so this bit over here tells us the magnitude and the fact that it's traveling in the opposite direction afterwards gives us the minus sign okay well let's just calculate our change of momentum so delta p that's just equal to final momentum let's say p2 minus p1 and um, our change of momentum will be m times my final velocity minus m times the initial velocity um, all i need to do now is just rearrange for the final velocity so um, mv is going to equal to delta p plus mu and finally all i need to do is just divide by m so v will be delta p plus mu divided by m okay so time to plug in some numbers and delta p will be minus 2.0 notice that we explained earlier why the minus sign is there plus the mass which is 0.16 multiply by the initial velocity which was 11 meters per second and we're just going to divide once again by the mass which is 0.16 now if we put those two number well those more than two numbers into a calculator we're going to get an answer of one and a half meters per second which leads us to the correct answer being a okay question 14 a container has an idea deal gas the mean square speed of the molecules is three times seven five meters per second uh, over a period of time a third of the gas molecules escape from the container okay so that's going to mean that two thirds remain so this might be relevant later on the pressure and the volume of the gas in the container remain the same what is the mean square speed of the molecules left in the container okay well what are the relevant formulas that can help us solve this question we know that the kinetic energy is equal to a half times the mass times the mean square speed so that's our mean square speed and that is also equal to three halves times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature both of these formulas are given in our formula sheet okay well let's see and uh, if we can find an expression of how does the mean square speed depend on the mass it's because if uh, only two-thirds of the mass remains our m will be two-thirds m okay well let's just do some cancellation so we can get rid of these twos and we can rearrange for the uh, mean square speed which is going to equal 3 kt divided by the m okay well now we see that if uh, m suddenly becomes 2 over 3 m c squared will actually increase so in other words if this guy is decreasing this will be increasing by the uh, by the same uh, fraction really so um 
if m gets decreased by 2 over 2 over 3, c, uh, the mean square speed will increase by the opposite fraction. And uh, the way we can express that is that the opposite fraction is just 3 over 2, and we're going to need to multiply that by our mean square speed, which is just 3 over 2 uh, multiplied by 3.0 times 10 to the 5 times 10 to the 5, which is just 1.5 really times 3.0 times 10 to the 5, which is going to give us 4.5 times 10 to the 5 ms meter squared s to the power of minus 2 squared. So this is c. And finally, question 15, which two quantities are related in Hubble's law? Now, let's just remember, so Hubble's law uh, says that the uh, speed of distance galaxies is directly proportional to our distance to them. So looking through all of those answers, the distance and the mass of the galaxies, we know that that's not correct. Uh, B, velocity and density of galaxies, that's also not correct. Uh, C, distance and velocities of the galaxies, it's going to be that one. Okay, folks, so hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you found this uh, useful, please uh, consider subscribing to the channel. If there are any questions about any of the questions, uh, please feel free to drop a comment down below.